A trial date has been set for the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell joint trial. Does a white Hyundai Elantra hold the key to the gruesome Idaho quadruple student slain? On the Delphi case, let's talk about firearm forensics. Alec Murdoch, his attorneys, be careful what you wish for. Another dating app incident, and then finally our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day. Welcome to Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. Thanks for watching. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Hit that little bell for notifications. And don't forget to leave me a comment. And remember, always you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. And before we can open the docket, well, we've got to support the people that support us. Go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription search, and you will be able to do as many background searches as you want on as many people as you want while you have that subscription. And the beautiful thing is you can cancel at any time. But when you do do a background search, you're going to get a report literally generated while you wait, and it's going to have information about the person you want more information about. And the information you're going to get, are they on some sort of public registry? Do they have a criminal record? Are they married? Are they divorced? Do they have civil judgments against them? You know, the things that people don't usually bring up the first time you meet them, like maybe on a dating app or something along those lines, you need to be careful. Do not commit dating malpractice. Go to crimetalksearch.com and get that background subscription service today. You'll be happy you did. Heck, it could possibly save your life. All right, let's go ahead and open the docket for December 8th, Thursday, December 8th, 2022. All right, finally, um, the murder trial for both Lori Vallow and Chad DeBell is now scheduled to begin on April 3rd of 2023. Set your calendar, block out 12 weeks. I assure you, Crime Talk will be going there sometime during the trial. I'm not sure why it's gonna take 12 weeks, but set your trial date. That's when it's going to go. Unless, of course, competency rears its ugly head again, or there's a motion to continue based upon being an effective assistance of counsel. Yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see. The way things have gone so far there, I wouldn't hold my breath, but I hope I am wrong. We'll see if the state of Idaho can get some justice for JJ and Ty Lee. Next on the docket, does a white Hyundai Elantra possibly hold a key to the gruesome Idaho quadruple student slain? Well, police are asking for information regarding a white Hyundai Elantra that was in the immediate area of the Moscow home where the four students were found deceased. And because we like accuracy and we're not going to summarize it because someone will simply say you forgot something, let's just go ahead and read the entire release from the Moscow Police Department. And it's from the Moscow Police Department communication media line. So if you have information, call them at 208-997-8701. It says the Moscow police are asking for the community's help. Huh, I wonder who suggested if they gave information that they didn't have enough information that they could go ask for the help of people. Huh, what, if only I could think of the guy who suggested that weeks ago, I just, hmm. Anyway, first, the Moscow Idaho detectives are interested in speaking with the occupants of a white 2011 through 2013 Hyundai Elantra with an unknown license plates. Tips and leads have led investigators to look for additional information about a vehicle being in the immediate area of the King Street residence during the early morning hours of November 13th. Investigators believe the occupant or occupants of this vehicle may have critical information to share regarding this case. If you know of or own a vehicle matching this description or know of anyone who may have been driving this vehicle on the days preceding or the day of the murders, please forward that information to the tip line. Information can be submitted to the tip line at 208 883-7180, or you can email it to tipline at ci.moscow.id.us, or the digital media go to fbi.gov slash Moscow, Idaho. 
Your information, whether you believe it is significant or not, might be the piece of the puzzle that helps investigators solve these murders. And then below are stock images of the 2011-2013 Hyundai Elantra and are not the actual vehicle. And then they state, at this time, no suspect has been identified and only vetted information that does not hinder the investigation will be released to the public. We encourage referencing official releases for accurate information and update progress. All press releases information related to this case are available. Asking for help. Radical idea. Let's hope it leads to some new information. Police did not elaborate in their uh, request why they believe the vehicle was somehow involved in the incident and said they did not know the car's license plate. Anyone's got any information? Let's check it out. Next on the docket, let's talk about the Delphi murders as it relates to the defendant, Mr. Allen, and the magic bullet as Mr. Allen's defense team has referred to it as um, in their uh, press releases. And I said I was somewhat critical of that uh, information, but to bring you the facts to let people know so you can make up your own mind, we've tried to bring you a little more information. So obviously the Indiana State Police Laboratory says that it confirmed that the unfired 40 caliber cartridge uh, was ejected out of a handgun of Richard Allen. Now the unfired round was found between the bodies allegedly of Abigail Williams and Libby German. This is the only piece of publicly disclosed evidence linking Mr. Allen to the actual crime scene. Now, in the probable cause affidavit used to charge Mr. Allen with two counts of murder, it is stated as a fact that an unspent 40 caliber round between the bodies of victims one and two was forensically determined to have been cycled through Mr. Richard Allen's Sig Sauer Model P226. Now, generally, ammunition is made of soft metals like brass, copper, and lead, and f firearms, the internal parts are made of much harder metals. The extractor, which ejects, pulls that bullet out and ejects it, is steel. So the extractor is steel, the ejector is steel. And those are going to scratch the cartridge case as it gets extracted or thrown from the gun. Now, experts will say that when you dive in deep and look at the marks via a microscope that they, the gun, will provide um, differences from each gun to gun. So is this science or junk? Now, the U.S. Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms offers a, a study published this year in the Journal of Forensic Science, and it says that a, a trio of Federal Bureau of Investigation scientists gave 172 certified tool mark examiner cartridges and guns and asked them to look for any matches. The reported instances of a false positive, which is errors where a cartridge and a gun were incorrectly matched, they represent was 0.933%, which is very, very low. Now, research backing tool mark analysis uh, has been called flawed by many people, including moi. The problem is that you can have a million studies that purport to show something, but if those studies are not properly designed, they're really not that meaningful. Now, the Innocence Project has a collection of university scientists that point to several issues with the uh, research supporting tool mark analysis. They include small sample sizes, standards set by tool mark examiners themselves. It's kind of easy to know the answer when you're the ones preparing the test, right? And often these studies are financed by law enforcement agencies that benefit the positive tool mark matches. The Innocence Project is uh, pressing against tool mark evidence, and during its uh, some 30 years of existence, it has used DNA to exonerate 375 wrongfully convicted individuals. An examination found that the flawed forensic evidence played a role in at least 51% of those erroneous convictions. The other 49%, and I'm being tongue-in-cheek, is false identification. Just saying. So you got junk science, false IDs. Two major factors for wrongful convictions. So the question for the courts is whether the science is current and reliable. Well, there's a case going on in Maryland right now regarding the conviction of a murder of a guy of 
by the name of Kobino Ibo Abruqua. Easy for me to say. A-B-R-U-Q-U-A-H. Well, there, there are 13 university professors are challenging the testimony of a tool mark examiner that linked bullets found in the murder victim to the defendant's gun. Now, the filed briefs state that studies supporting the analysis are well below threshold of any scientific validity. Now, this dispute looks like it is likely obviously going to play out in the upcoming trial of Mr. Allen. And in a press release last week, as I noted before, Allen's attorneys dismissed the prosecution's theory of a single magic bullet said to be matched to their client's handgun. The release goes on to state that it is uh, safe to say that the discipline of toolmark identification is anything but science. And the SIG P226, owned by Mr. Mallon, is a mass-produced firearm uh, from the same die. So unless there is something so distinctive about Mr. Allen's firearm, the prosecution may have trouble identifying it as something completely unique to show that it was, in fact, Mr. Allen's firearm. Like I said, I stated to you last week in our live, I think that that evidence is weak. Tool mark analysis is subjective. The police put that themselves in the affidavit because they were trying to make sure they didn't say that, hey, this is absolutely certain. They said it's subject to opinion, and that opinion is subjective to the person making the call. Reasonable people can differ when it is a subjective analysis. All right, next on the docket, Alex Murdoch. All right, we talked about the defense filing a motion for a bill of particulars in the case saying, we just have no idea what the prosecution theory of the case is, and therefore we need a bill of particulars. And I said, well, that's really not what a bill of particulars is for, but we'll see what the prosecution responds with. Let me tell you, this is probably some of the best um, analysis that I've seen and some nice little quips uh, thrown in there in this legal writing that I think it is worth reading almost the entire response. And because it's so well written and it kind of tells the defense, be careful what you wish for, because not only did the def not only did the prosecution say, hey, this is not what a bill of particulars is meant for, but wait, wait, wait. We'll lay out our theory of prosecution. And oh, by the way, judge, treat this as a motion to allow our 404B evidence to help show motive. Ouch. Boom. It's so good. I'm going to read it to you. So sit back and enjoy. Read along. This is from the prosecution's response in opposition to the defendant's motion for a bill of particulars and state's motion to admit evidence of motive. Wow. While motive is not an element of the case, the motive is the most important fact the jury would want to know in understanding why defendant murdered his own wife and son. To properly evaluate motive, the jury will need to understand the distinction between who Alec Murdoch appeared to be to the outside world, a successful lawyer and scion of the most prominent family in the region, and who he was in real life, only he fully knew. An allegedly crooked lawyer and drug user who borrowed and stole wherever he could to stay afloat and one step ahead of detection. Proof of years of Alec Murdoch's unbroken series of misappropriations, lies, loans, debts, and thefts is necessary to explain that distinction to a jury. It is also necessary proof to show how he avoided accountability for allegedly defrauding victims of over $8.7 million for so long, and how he kept this fantasy persona of wealth, respectability, and prominence alive. Only then can a jury understand that the clouds of defendants' pass were gathering into a perfect storm that was going to expose the real Alec Murdoch to the world, and which would mean facing real accountability for life. On June 7th, 2021, the day defendant murdered Maggie and Paul. Murdoch asked the court to require the state to file a bill of particular, stating that the alleged motive is intended to present a trial. Murdoch pleads ignorance regarding what 
it is the state intends to introduce a trial and concern for judicial economy, despite the fact that he has access starting in January of 2022 to the state grand jury discoveries and all transcripts, which lay out a roadmap to each one of the charges in these 18 state grand jury indictments containing 90 charges against the defendant. Regardless, a review of the authorities cited by Murdoch reveals that there is no precedent in modern South Carolina jurisprudence to justify ordering any such bill of particulars, and that the narrow purpose of its more than a century ago would be inconsistent with today's jurisprudence regarding notice. It says the state is sensitive to the need for judicial efficiency. Accordingly, as set forth in Section 2 of this filing, the state moves in limine to admit as relevant evidence of Murdoch's financial wrongdoings committed over the course of 15 years leading to his murder of Maggie and Paul Murdoch, as well as the evidence of the events on the side of the old Sakalachi Road on September 4th of 2021. Now, just quickly, we're going to get through the parts. this part here. There's no provision in the South Carolina requiring the presentation or delivery of bill of particulars. Instead, the notice of which defendants are entitled to is based on the rule-guided discovery process and the indictment itself, which can be challenged for sufficiency if the defense believes they have not received adequate notice. Today, the indictment is strictly notice document, albeit one required by our state constitution rather than a jurisdictional vehicle. And Murdoch does not contend any confusion as to the offense charged. The indictment clearly alleges that Murdoch, on June 7th, 2021, brutally shot his wife and son to death with a rifle and a shotgun. The elements of the offense are set forth in the indictment. Murdoch, a former prosecutor, and his defense team are familiar with the crimes and elements charged. As Murdoch complains, he has been provided more than a million pages of documentary evidence to include access to the transcripts of testimony before the state grand jury, which detail his many thefts to cover bad debts and even growing likelihood of his exposure as fraud non parelli in his community, culminating in the confrontations and immediate certainty of exposure he faced on June 7th, 2021. The indictments and surrounding circumstances sufficiently apprise Murdoch of what he is called upon the answer. The evidence of all defendants' alleged financial and other misdeeds, over 80 state grand jury charges, is in fact very extensive. That is not the state's fault. There is so much of it out there to be gathered. If anything, it's the defendant's fault. Nonetheless, the state says, it is sensitive to the need for judicial efficiency, particularly in a case scheduled to last for multiple weeks. Accordingly, the state moves for a ruling by the court in limine to admit as relevant, subject to analysis under Rules 402, 403, and 404B under the South Carolina Rules of Evidence, and subject to proper foundation laid at the time of trial, all such competent evidence of the relationship between the murders of Maggie and Paul and years of financial difficulty, fraud, and theft, wrongdoing sufficient to imprison him for life. Then it starts to get good. First, we got to lay out the law. The rules of evidence must be construed to conserve fairness in administration, elimination of unjustifiable expense and delay, and promotion of growth and development of the law of evidence to the end that the truth may be ascertained. The purpose of a motion limine is to prevent disclosure of potentially prejudicial matters to the jury, which means they want it ruled on beforehand. Evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts is not admissible to prove character of a person in order to show that they acted to show action in conformity therewith. It may, however, be admissible to show motive, identity, the existence of a common scheme or plan, or the absence of mistake or accident or intent. Although relevant, evidence may be excluded if it is probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issue, or misleading the jury, or by considerations of undue delay, waste of time, and needless presentation of cumulative evidence. In determining whether to admit evidence of other bad acts, the trial judge must first determine if the evidence is relevant. Second, the judge must determine if the prior bad act evidence falls within one of the permissible exceptions of Rule 404B of the South Carolina Rules of Evidence, and whether there is a logical relevancy or connection between the other crime and the some disputed fact or element of the crime charged. Third, 
When the defendant has not been convicted of the other bad acts, the trial judge must determine whether the evidence of those other bad acts is clear and convincing. Clear and convincing is more than mere preponderance, but less than is required for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It does not mean clear and unequivocal. And fourth, and finally, the trial judge must weigh the probative value of the evidence against the potential prejudicial effect. Evidence must be excluded from trial if its probative value substantially outweighs the danger of unfair prejudice. One of the well here and here comes the good stuff. One of the well-established exceptions to the general prohibition against evidence of other bad acts is the evidence that tends to prove motive. Motive is an individual's reason for taking some action. And although motive is not required element of the offense like murder, the existence of motive can shed light on the identity of the perpetrator, and the presence or absence of motive is a circumstance that can and likely will be considered by a jury. Accordingly, motive can be and frequently is of critical importance to the resolution of a case, and as a result, courts generally broadly allow the admission of other bad evidence when it may shed light on the defendant's motives. And here's the really, really good stuff. We've got through the law. We've got through the punch in the nose that the prosecution gave to the defense. And here's the evidence that they uh, intend to admit. In the present case, Murdoch's motive for committing the murders is an issue of obvious importance. In addition to the general significant evidence of motive can have in any murder trial, Murdoch has been charged with murdering his wife and son, two integral members of his own immediate family. Since people are naturally expected to love their wives and sons instead of brutally gunning them down, why Murdoch did what he is accused of doing, will unquestionably weigh on any rational juror's mind when deciding whether the state met its burden of proof. Therefore, any evidence bearing on Murdoch's motive for the killing has heightened probative value in this case under the circumstances involved. Beyond that, Murdoch himself places the issue of motive front and center through his own actions. Demonstrating that fact, Murdoch, within just over 30 seconds of beginning to speak to the police first officers to arrive at the scene on June 7, 2021, suggested to law enforcement the killer's motive stemmed from the February 2019 boat wreck that resulted in the tragic death of Mallory Beach. In fact, Murdoch expressed certainty and stated he knew that's what it is, the boat case to the responding officer. Thus, Based on his own statements, Murdoch placed motive into issue from the outset of law enforcement's investigations into the killing, and he tried to tie the motive to events that had occurred more than two years earlier. Significantly, based on the evidence that has been uncovered during the investigation into the killings, Murdoch was the only individual with a true motive to kill his wife and son. As to the motive, the evidence will show Murdoch accrued substantial debts over a period of years to cover those debts, began engaging in illicit financial crimes involving the theft and misappropriation of money from his clients and his own law firm. The evidence will further show those financial crimes were about to come to light at the time of the killings, more specifically on the date of the killings. Personnel at Murdoch's law firm had demanded Murdoch provide an explanation no later than than that day as to where hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees owed to the firm, but stolen by Murdoch had gone, and Murdoch had neither the money nor the plausible legal explanation with which to respond to the demand. Meanwhile, a motion to compel for production of Murdoch's personal financial records was at the same time pending in civil litigation stemming from the fatal boat wreck and at a hearing on that motion was going to be held within a few days. If granted, as expected, the motion would have resulted in the exposure of Murdoch's financial records, which would itself have led to his misdeeds becoming known to others. Ultimately, the murder served as Murdoch's means to shift the focus away from himself and to buy himself some additional time to try and prevent his financial crimes from becoming uncovered, which, if revealed, would have resulted in personal, legal, and financial ruin for Murdoch. And it absolutely worked until a PMPED staffer came across a check on September 2, 2022, which started the process of unraveling the whole thing. In finer detail, the state intends to prove the following at trial. 
defendant came from a family with a singular position of prominence and respect in the community. He had, however, been able to avoid accountability throughout his life. While outwardly giving the illusion of financial wealth from his lucrative law practice, a series of bad land deals exacerbated by the recession permanently changed his finances. While some thought defendant had recovered with some large cases in the early part of 2011 through 2015, such as the Thomas Pickney, Piler, and the Badger cases, defendant had become so dependent on a constant velocity of money to service his huge debt and maintain his lifestyle that even the millions in fees were not enough. In addition to borrowing from anyone who would lend him money from banks to family to his partners, defendant also started to allegedly steal millions from clients, his firm, and his family in order to keep his head above water. Defendant allegedly stole through four main schemes. First, he stole by billing personal expenses to his clients and on firm credit cards or accounts. Second, he stole from his own family and the firm by, in one instance, taking a six-figure loan repayment check he knew had been erroneously issued to him, claiming he lost that check and getting another one issued, depositing the second check and then waiting months to deposit the first, thus stealing the same money twice. The third scheme through which defendant allegedly stole clients' funds was having PMPED, Client Trust Account Disbursements Checks, made out to the Palmetto State Bank. He then would have Palmetto State Bank Executive Russell Lafitte convert those client checks to defendant's personal use for such things as paying off defendant's debt to defendant's father, to Russell Lafitte's father, and to PSB. Defendant and Russell Lafitte also used allegedly stolen client money to pay off almost $1 million in loans Russell Lafitte had loaned from his conservatorship over Murdoch's clients, the Piler girls, in order to keep defendant afloat. Defendant would either have Russell Lafitte as a conservator or personal representative sign the client disbursements accountings in which the funds were sent to PSB were listed among other funds. Or, defendant would convince clients nothing was amiss on the disbursement accounting while they were focusing on the substantial funds they were receiving and not noticing something as innocuous looking on its face as a disbursement to Palmetto State Bank. The fourth scheme through which defendant allegedly stole clients' funds was through a fake forge account, which he opened at Bank of America in 2015 under the name of Richard A. Murdoch, doing business as Forge. Forge Consulting LLC was a legitimate company used by plaintiffs' lawyers as a consultant to match clients receiving large settlements with annuity companies. Once defendant was able to open an account with Forge name on it, he could then have clients' funds dispersed from PMPED trust account on a check made out to Forge. Like checks made out to PSB, entries on the disbursement sheets to the known name Forge did not attract staff or clients' attention, particularly when the clients were diverted by large sums they were receiving from legitimate entries on the disbursements' accounts. During this time, defendant was allegedly stealing millions from clients despite also earning millions in reported income from his law practice. Defendant was also borrowing millions from wherever and whomever he could. The evidence will show defendant bounced between massive interest payments and inadequate principal payments and consistently carried staggering six-figure balances on multiple debts, including lines of credit and even a credit card. He borrowed nearly a million dollars from one law partner over a period of years, as well as hundreds of thousands from his father and Russell Lafitte's father. All of the millions of dollars coming to defendant from legitimate income to the stolen client funds to large loans and credit cards, still not enough to stop the incessant financial roller coaster on which defendant put himself. Things only got worse on February 23, 2019, when the boat crash happened, resulting in the death of Mallory Beach. Not only was Paul facing very serious criminal liability, and the possibility of a 25 or more years in prison, but defendant and his family were now facing significant civil liability for the events leading to Mallory's death, with the Beach family filing a civil lawsuit filed against the defendant and his son Buster on May 24th of 2019. The plaintiff's attorney in the civil boat case made it clear they were seeking nothing less than an aggressive monetary recovery from defendant's personal assets. Tellingly, the aftermath of the boat case 
also saw a large uptick in the amount of funds defendants started to allegedly steal, including over $3 million from the Satterfield recovery and about $4.5 million total from clients during January of 2019 until April of 2021 alone. The boat case also marked a large uptick in the checks defendant had been writing to various associates, such as Curtis Eddie Smith. While some of his money was for narcotic pills, the pace of Eddie alone increased to over $1 million alone in 2021. The amount of the individual's checks increased as well. The defendant had one possible saving grace in a plaintiff case defendant was sharing with Chris Wilson. The decision from a bench trial was issued in February of 2021 and resulted in fees of $792,000 to defendant, $600,000 for one case and $192,000 for the other. However, defendant convinced Chris Wilson to make the checks for the fees out to him personally instead of to PMPED as it should have been. The defendant deposited those checks into his personal account in March and April of 2021, thus ensuring that he could get the money right away and then stay afloat, as opposed to having to wait until the end of the year for PMPED to disperse fees as part of his bonus. This windfall over three quarters of a million dollars only provided a brief respite from the pressure that continued to amount on defendant as it quick as he quickly spent. Defendant's civil attorneys had finally told the plaintiff's attorney in the Bo case the defendant had no p- money to personally pay any settlement. Incredulous and still believing he was very wealthy, the plaintiff's attorneys filed a motion to compel on October 16th of 2020 demanding defendant disclose his bank accounts, assets, and finances. In that, If that motion was granted, as was expected, the true picture of defendant's finances and his years of alleged theft would be quickly exposed. The hearing was initially scheduled for May of 2021, but was in- continued until June 10th of 2021. Meanwhile, in May of 2021, staff at PMPED had become suspicious when they noticed that they had received the expense check from the case defendant had with Chris Wilson, but had not received the fee check. Their inquiries to Wilson's office did not get to the bottom of the matter, and they could not get satisfactory answers from the defendant as to where the fees were. The problems were discussed with partners at PMPED, and they were worried defendant was trying to hide income because of the boat case. On top of this, in March April and May of 2021, state grand jury subpoenas about the boat case were issued for testimony or documents to various witnesses and institutions with a connection or presence in Hampton and the 14th Circuit. All of these factors start to converge on June 7th of 2021. On June 7th of 2021, defendants' finances were falling apart. He didn't have enough to pay back Chris Wilson to cover up the fact that he had bypassed the firm of $792,000 in fees. On June 7th of 2021, defendant was in the office working on the disclosures in the boat case because a hearing on the motion to compel discovery of defendant's finances was scheduled for June 10th of 2021, just a few days later. Disclosures of the finances would expose defendant for the years of his alleged misdeeds. There would be no continuance this time. On June 7th of 2021, a PMPED staffer came into defendant's office and demanded an answer that day as to where the bypass fees were. However, on June 7th, defendant had already spent the fees and could not pay them back to cover his tracks. On June 7th of 2021, defendant received word that his father had been taken to the hospital with a very poor prognosis. Defendant's father had previously loaned defendant money or co-signed loans for defendant. On June 7th of 2021, defendant murdered Maggie and Paul. Immediately everything changed. People immediately treated defendant as the victim of an unspeakable tragedy. Everyone backed off their inquiries and rallied around him. The PMPED partners and staff were no longer seeking immediate answers about the bypass fees and stopped making inquiries. The hearing on the motion to compel was canceled, and a personal recovery against defendant in the civil case was in jeopardy as a practical matter. The day of reckoning vanished. In the time the aftermath of the murder gave him, defendant set about covering his tracks. He borrowed money to cover enough of the bypass fees so that Chris Wilson could send them to PMPED as if they had been there all along. 
He borrowed from a law partner and continued to write checks to Eddie Smith at an accelerated rate. It might have worked, but for the fact that on September 2, 2021, staff at PMPED discovered the defendant's office, a copy of one of the fee checks Chris Wilson had written to defendant directly. It was taken to the PMPED finance offices where it triggered staff there to take a closer look at one of the forge matters that had taken a back seat in the wake of the murders. Some more research was done. Partners were called with the findings. And on September 3rd, 2021, defendant was ultimately confronted with the discoveries of his misdeeds and resigned. On September 4th, 2021, Chris Wilson finally was able to get the defendant to meet with him and discuss the resignation and the $192,000 defendant owed Wilson for covering the shortfall in the payment of the bypassed fees of PMPED. Within hours of the defendant meeting, while the friend he betrayed on the front porch of defendant's mother's house, as accountability started to fall apart, Alex Murdoch again, defendant suddenly became the victim of a shooting on the side of the road on the old Sakalachi Road. People initially rallied to his aid again, only this time the facts came to light quicker. And then there's a little more legal analysis, but guess what? That is the prosecution's theory of the case, that the murders of Maggie and Paul were financially related. I mean, let's face it, we all kind of knew that, but... The uh, writer of this motion, and although it was signed by Creighton Waters, I doubt he wrote it himself, uh, but somebody in his office um, should become a novelist. Uh, That is going to be a great opening statement, and then they go into uh, the scene of the murder and all the cover-up, et cetera, as to why Alex Murdoch was there. So I know that was a little bit long, but I thought it was so good it was worth reading. All right. On with the remainder of the docket. A Wisconsin man was arrested last month for kidnapping an elderly woman and victimizing several women he met on dating apps and is reportedly at the center of a uh, two-death investigation. That's right. Law enforcement states that the mother of suspect Timothy Olson found a woman dead in their shared home in Racine, Wisconsin on November 8th. The following day, Olson allegedly drove the deceased woman's car to Illinois and abandoned it there. According to the reports, Olson is being investigated for a woman's death, which occurred two weeks after the incident at his home. In that case, Kim Michelance died days after she lost consciousness while with Olson at a Milwaukee bar. Authorities have not publicly named the deceased woman in the November 8th case, and uh, law enforcement has stated that the body was discovered in Olson's bed. Olson was arrested on November 29th while facing allegations that he scammed three women who lost consciousness while with him and kidnapped a 79-year-old woman. The uh, police charged Olson with kidnapping, identity theft, and burglary for a November 23rd incident as well. Um, Olson, uh, according to the uh, reports, Olson approached an elderly woman who was drinking at a restaurant and asked to buy her a drink. After the victim declined and left the restaurant, Mr. Olson then allegedly cornered her in the parking lot and held her against her will in her car for several hours while claiming to have a gun. He is also accused of stealing credit cards and cash from the victim. And then in early November, Racine police warned the public about Olson victimizing women he met on dating apps. Olson was later linked to three victims in other jurisdictions, including a woman who claimed she was roofied. From behind bars, Olson has stated that um, he never drugged women and that uh, they give him gifts, including credit cards. These women lie, he says, and everybody believes it. That's his story, and he's sticking to it. Dating apps, ladies and gentlemen, be afraid. Be very, very afraid. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. A Michigan man who allegedly made anti-Semitic and racist threats to parents and children at a preschool and synagogue last week made a revealing disclosure at a court hearing at the Wayne County uh, Courthouse when he pulled his pants down and mooned the presiding judge in a separate case. Now, following the mooning, the judge, Regina Thomas, uh, approved the prosecutor's request to have a $1 $1 million bond for Mr. Uh, Hassan Choker revoked. Mr. Choker was appearing in court and uh, didn't like the way things were going and mooned the district attorney and the judge. 
Mr. Choker's defense attorney, thinking quickly on his feet, claimed that his client was expressing his First Amendment rights and freedom of speech. Well, during the other statements he was charged with and was also doing so um, when he was mooning the um, judge in court as well. Uh, the judge said, uh, you don't get to say and do whatever you want without there being consequences. And um, so your client finds himself today. He exercised his rights. And the judge said, I'm exercising my right to give him a consequence for that. Uh, nothing uh, that any of us do in life is without consequences, the judge noted. And needless to say, the bond was, in fact, revoked. Mr. Choker currently faces two counts of ethnic intimidation. So there you go. I know it was a long one today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.